I'm Leo Landis, the state curator for the State Historical Society of Iowa. I got my start in museum work at Living History Farms in 1986. Uh, I have my bachelor's from Iowa State, master's from Eastern Illinois University in museum work, uh, did PhD work at Iowa State in agriculture and rural history Midwest, uh, 19th century, so uh, 18, really about 1825 into the 20th, 20th century, so my areas of expertise go up to about 1970 uh, in, in research and, and interests, uh, but mostly rural, mostly uh, uh, <clears throat> Midwest, and then the only other thing I'd throw in there is besides working at the State Historical Society and Living History Farms, I also worked at Salisbury House and Gardens, which is a 1920s home here in Des Moines, so that was kind of a fun experience, or not kind of, it was an excellent experience to get some urban history and in the period we're going to be talking about. Uh, also worked as a curator at Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan for eight years and, and a museum in Indianapolis area for about three and a half years. So uh, native Iowan as I said, but uh, also worked at places other than the State Historical Society. So. Welcome and thank you for coming to the Best Practices in Iowa and World War I. And I want to hit some of my favorite sources, but also give you some leads on either lesson plans, text sets that are out there, and also uh, just before I get started, it's designed for a high school curriculum, but Jennifer Cooley and the Department of Education and, and Stephanie Wager in the Department of Education. Uh, who you all know Stephanie, but uh, Jennifer Cooley's part of our education department here in the uh, Department of Cultural Affairs and the State Historical Museum are working on some text sets for World War I designed for high school. And so there will be one launched this fall uh, sponsored by the Library of Congress. So keep an eye out for an email from Stephanie announcing that that, and, and you might be able to, if you're doing middle school, be able to pull some content out of that as well. So, just so you know, uh, the photos you're looking at, I don't like to just throw photos up on the screen and say, oh, background images. Grace Van Evra from Scott County is on your left. Yeah. Uh, that photo in the middle is the men who were working at the YMC, as the YMCA uh, liaisons at Camp Dodge uh, in north of Des Moines in Johnston. And I love that if you look at that photo, and these are all from our collections at the State Historical Society, there's one African-American man down there. Uh, so it's uh, mostly all other Iowans and, and one African-American man. And then that's uh, Billy Smith, who is a Meskwaki uh, member, and so from Tama County. And he uh, served in World War I. I. I just learned this from one of my colleagues. We used his photo in our exhibit downstairs in a slideshow, but he kept a diary in Meskwaki. And it's at the Meskwaki Museum in Tama. So, uh, just a selection of Iowans who served. Actually, Grace served overseas too, but we're going to talk about Iowans in service at home as well. So we'll hit a number of topics in this morning's program. Service in general. How's the focus on that for you guys, by the way? Looking OK? All right. Anti-Germanism, propaganda posters, and prohibition and suffrage, and a, and a few other uh, home front topics. But that prohibition and suffrage is, is a big one in this period. And so if you're talking about Iowa in World War I and the United States in World War I, uh, that's a, a great one to keep in the background because we get so focused on, you know, what I learned in high school was Maine, M-A-I-N, which is militarism, uh, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism, the four four causes of World War I, and that was about it. That's what I remember from high school, uh, World War I. And there's so many rich, deep stories in our state about World War I and what's happening both internationally but also culturally at home. So that's what we're going to talk about. Just uh, photos here, a, another nurse over in France. That's Jonas Pawashik over there, another Meskwaki member. He actually went to work uh, after the war for the Department of History and Archives, the predecessor to the State Museum. So he was hired to work in the uh, museum up at the old museum, now the Ola Babcock Miller Building. And it was uh, just last Thursday, 
About 1,200 men reported to Fort Des Moines. The reason why Army Post Road on the south side of Des Moines is Army Post Road is because it takes you to Fort Des Moines. And it's a National Historic Landmark today. I'm sure some of you know that. The reason it's a National Historic Landmark is because in World War II, they trained the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, but equally significant is during World War I on June 15th, 1917, 1,200 African American men reported to train as officers for the first time in United States history. And there were men, uh, mostly central Iowa, but there was at least one from Iowa City that I know, and that's one thing I've been working on in my history research is to figure out who were the Iowans that reported for officers training 100 years ago. For the first time in American history, it was African American men are going to be trained specifically as officers and we're going to bring in a pool of 1200. So that happened here in Iowa just on the south side of Des Moines. So that's the, uh, their provisional commissioning took place October 15, 1917. So they don't report immediately to France. In fact, most of them uh, or a number of them don't ever go over to France. They serve stateside too. But this is the uh, captain's group uh, at Fort Des Moines in October of 1918 down there. So if you're doing a text set or a lesson plan, and I'm going to speak in text set kind of uh, language, some compelling questions that you can create your own, but uh, three examples that might be worth using in your classroom are why help the war effort when you don't have the same freedoms? Uh, that applies for women. <laughs> uh, you don't have the right to vote when the war starts. And Sorry, I, I didn't mention this, but I think all of you know, you know, the war starts in 1914, but we don't join in the United States until April 5th, April 6th, excuse me, uh, 1917. So <clears throat> women don't have the right to vote, at least on a federal level, some, and in the state of Iowa in state elections in 1917 when the war starts. Also, what is acceptable social pressure during the war? And that's uh, a topic we're going to talk about too today. And are some weapons too horrific even in warfare? Uh, so those are just a few examples of compelling questions. My PowerPoint will be on the uh, shared drive that Stephanie put together. So if you miss something, you can go back and look at this PowerPoint. It's only 10 megs, so it's not you know, like a 200 meg download for you or anything. This is one of my favorite sources. And if you don't know this yet, if you're doing local history topics, and I'm going to pull up the website for it here in a second. But Rod Library at University of Northern Iowa has gone to the effort to make a portal with all the newspapers that are freely available in a digital format across the state. And I'll pull up some examples, but I'm going to show you the screen just so you can look at it. This link is on your handout. to have that screen up first. So they've organized, oh, well, come on. There we go. Uh, they've organized it alphabetically, so it starts out with Ackley, which is up in, uh, is that uh, Hardin County? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I know the general area. I'm pretty sure, I was pretty sure Ackley was. Uh, but then you've got Akron, so you're up in northwest Iowa with Akron. So even if it doesn't have any of your towns, you know, you've got Applington, so you're kind of northeast. Audubon County, so you're west. Uh, Hamilton County, so uh, you've got the Freeman Journal. And it'll tell you the run of the paper. So 1872 to 2010, it's like, okay, that's fabulous. So if these are all freely available. They're part of the... Uh, newspapers that libraries across the state have put in grant requests, often to us or to a local community foundation. They've taken the original materials and they've made them searchable. And so I'm going to do one really quick and see how, I, I actually cheated beforehand because I'm going to show you one. I, I pulled up a Kingsley uh, piece and I'll show you the screen. Oh, I could do Keokuk, but I didn't check since we've got somebody from Keokuk, but. So you see Kingsley's from 1883 to 2013. Oh, I've got a pretty good connection, yeah. So I'll always go to the advanced search on this. And when Advantage Company, who'd put this 
portal together for these sites. They really didn't design it for real deep searching, but it, it works. And usually your students who are smarter than most of us at using the internet will be able to do this. So I'll always go to the advanced search. And what I'm going to show you is, is a search I did. I'm going to actually do it again. And I'll always go to find exact word. And I gave you some of the, the phrases uh, that you're going to want to use uh, in the next slide. But I'm going to use junior red. I'll usually try to put two words together because I know the junior red cross was a big deal. So we'll go junior red. And I'm using exact word or phrase. Then I scroll down. And you don't have to worry about country or any of that because you're in the Kingsley page. So I'll just go 1917. Of course, I didn't hit my 917 there. It doesn't want to jump down. So we'll just do it this way. 1917. And you could even say, well, you know the war doesn't start till April, so you could make it April. It's because my number lock is on. One, nine, one, eight. And we'll end it in 1919, and we'll put January 1, because the war ends on November 11th, 1918. And then I'll just hit search. Of course, sorry, I'm, you know what's going on there. But we've got uh, five results. And you can look at a little preview there. So I won't take you to the jump, because I've got a slide of this coming up, or I can take you to the actual PDF that I like. So the one I really liked was this Kingley, Kingsley News Times from uh, April 25th, 1918. And we're going to go down to that Glee Club operetta here in a minute. But as you all know from looking at newspapers, there's always going to be great stuff that may not be directly related to what you're playing. And so if you're doing something anti-German related, it just so happened that on this page, Playing at the gym theater in Moville is the Kaiser, which is this you know, vehemently anti-German film. So you not only got the Glee Club who's hosting an operetta that the proceeds benefit the Junior Red Cross, you also got this great advertisement for an anti-German film that's showing in town. So you know, people think sometimes in small town Iowa, things didn't penetrate in the way that they do in larger towns, and it's like, the film The Kaiser is being promoted across the state when it's showing in theaters. So uh, that's, you know, you've got this German soldier standing over uh, prone, I think it's a woman. That, you know, image is a little rough, but uh, that's, that's the sort of stuff that you can find through that UNI site, as I said, that has all those different newspapers. So file that one away because it will. It'll have newspapers from across the state. Go back, you know, we've got Boone County, Republican from 73 to 97. Uh, Blairstown, so we're in uh, Benton County, 1917. But uh, things from all over the state to do those searches. So even if it's not in your town, you know, I don't see Lamoni, but I see Lenox, so a little farther to the uh, west. Uh, Sheraton, Centerville's there, the Iowegian from 1857 to 2012, I'll actually use because we've got a handful of Centerville folks. I've got something I pulled from the Centerville paper here in just a minute. So if you're doing local history research, it's not as good for, central, for the big papers in central Iowa. That's the drawback to it. But uh, <laughs> these are some of the terms that you'll want to use. So as I said, I just did junior red when I wanted the red cross. Yellow paint, the reason why you want yellow paint as a search term is one of the things that they did to people they didn't feel were being patriotic enough, and this happens in multiple instances across the state, is they would go to a business 
and they would paint the fence or the door or the outside of the building with yellow paint and say these people are not patriotic. And so yellow paint is a search term to use when you're looking for uh, digital searches. Uh, Red Cross or just Cross Nurse, again, you, if you type in Red Cross Nurse, you might get odd hits. If you type in Cross Nurse, you'll probably get the same hits, but more specific. So two words usually is what I prefer rather than three. Uh, another good term, though, you'll get you know, nailed with hundreds of hits, if not dozens. You'll get dozens, if not hundreds, is just using the term hun. And a term that we don't use anymore, but it was a French uh, slur for the Germans, is Bosch, B-O-C-H-E. So that's what Bosch means. So if you're ever looking at local newspapers and see the word Bosch, and it gets used a lot during World War I, that's what that's referring to. And then if you're looking for, and this happens in a lot of newspapers, a soldier riding home that gets reprinted, somewhere in France is what they will use. So you could write somewhere as a search term, and you might get that, or somewhere in, but you can try somewhere in France. So those are you know, six really good terms to look for in digital newspaper searches. Any questions or comments as uh, we get through that? Good deal. So this is an example, it's a little tough to see, I realize, from the Jefferson B. And it's kind of breaking my heart. I've got it as a PDF, I think, so I might bring it up as a PDF and, and enlarge it for you guys. But this is uh, August 14th. Let's see, we had somebody from Kemper, so this is great, because your good German Catholic community is out there in Carroll County. There was a bank that had the audacity to call themselves before the war. I mean, they were long before the war because you've got these. There's German Lutherans in Carroll County, too, I know. Sorry, if, but lots of German Catholics. So they had German Savings Bank was the name of one of their banks. Woe unto you if you had a name German in your title in the 1917, 1918 period. So I, I know you can't read this, so I'm going to bring up the PDF, try to enlarge it. because it's in that drive right there. Get off the Kingsley. I'll bring that Kingsley one up just a little bit more for you to see. I'll... No, I'm not. Because I don't want to waste your time and mine playing around with things. <coughs> uh, but when it's not a PDF, it's not going to let me get any bigger than that. So sorry about this, folks but we'll get there. Oh, I'm not used to that. All right. Uh, what this is covering in this uh, newspaper is that the Carroll uh, German Savings Bank in August of 1918 <laughs> changed their name. They dropped the word German from their bank name because they were getting so much bad press and being viewed as not patriotic. And the Carroll paper even puts together uh, questions in this column here to ask people you think might be sympathetic to Germans to see if they're really sympathetic to Germany. So it says, you know, uh, do you believe it was right for the German soldiers to... Uh, I think that's the rape of Belgium, yeah, going on here. So was it right to sink the Lusitania? And if they say, no, it wasn't right, then they're on the correct path. But then the, the last question is, uh, you know, if you believe uh, that the Kaiser is evil, essentially, and it, we should do everything possible to defeat Germany, and if he says or she says yes to that, then they're safe. So this is the sort of material, and especially in a German Catholic community where, you know, your parents or perhaps you came over from Germany, and that's the, so, the, the sort of social pressure that's being put on Iowans all across the state. And if you're uh, from a German background, which that's the primary population of our state, at least foreign-born and cultural uh, heritage of our state in the 19-teens, and even into today, this is a big deal. So another example is up in Kasuth County, uh, 
the town of Germania changes their name to Lakota. Uh, it was only men could vote, so I think the final uh, vote was in a small town, but was 40 uh, to 28 uh, to change their name to Lakota. Uh, they used to have a sauerkraut days event up there. <laughs> and uh, so that's the sort of you know, cultural tradition that people were proud of. And then during World War I, all sorts of social pressures are being put on you. And, and you might get your business, as we said, uh, smeared with yellow paint if you didn't participate in a bond drive sufficiently, if you didn't, uh, you know, do something, host a, an event in your theater, and that happened in, in Sioux City. There was a theater owner who uh, didn't sufficiently show his patriotism. He had a German background, and so one day he went out and his theater uh, exterior was painted with yellow paint. And you'd see country homes uh, in communities get their fences painted with yellow paint. So that's why I said use that yellow paint search term. Is that a nationwide phenomenon or just not? Uh, <clears throat> I think you heard Peter's got a big voice, but he said, is that a nationwide phenomena or Iowa? Iowa is a little more radicalized in anti-Germanism just because of the concentration of German Iowans, but also uh, it did happen in other states too, mostly Midwest, uh, but to a degree, you know, uh, Great Plains as well. But it's, it's that period where we're kind of the place to be in the 19-teens. Uh, our population was right around 2.5 million then. Uh, we were the best, we still have the best soil in the world, and if you wanted to be a farm state, and so we had attracted all these German immigrants, a lot of Czech, a lot of Irish, but because of the concentration of, of German heritage in our state, it is a look, it's more prevalent in Iowa. That's not gonna work if I hit an advanced screen. And they reprinted uh, something from the Carroll newspaper just to say uh, what had happened. Here's another resource if you want to do local history research. It's on your uh, handout. It's the registration cards that are available. And it's the third bolded section draft registration. Students can look up draft registrations from their town or ancestors through this link uh, that's below. It's not on the screen. And there were three registration periods. So the first one is June 5th, 1917. That's for 21 to 31 year olds. So this is an example right here of a registration card. See a registration card from that first registration and if you watch the PBS uh, Great War series, this is how I learned this. If you see a clipped corner, it's African American. And so this is the front of the card, that's the back side of the card. That's why the bottom right is clipped on the right side to you all, and the bottom left is clipped on this one. So that's, if, if you're ever doing this search and you see a card with the name you're looking for and that corner's clipped, it's an African American. So this is a gentleman from Waterloo, Iowa. He was born November 15, 1887. Uh, he was born in Mississippi. He's natural born citizen. He works at an auto service uh, dealership for the Wor Willard Storage Battery Company in Waterloo. He's a driver for automobiles. Uh, he has one person who depends on him, his mother. And he's single, says his ancestry is African. And then it asks if you have any other service in your past. And so he had three years uh, in the infantry, so the U.S. Army, and uh, he claims an exemption based on his military service. He actually gets called up. We've got in our World War I exhibit a honor roll of African American men from Iowa, and his name is on that honor roll. That's why I looked him up on, on my own, just to figure out some of the names on our honor roll. We've got about 150 names of African American men on that honor roll. It was, uh, you should check out the exhibit if you have a little free time during lunch. And then on the back side, it just lists uh, the, the descriptions for your physical stature are, are you tall, medium, or short? So he says he's medium. 
and then it's your build, which are you, uh, I think it's thin, medium, or uh, I can't remember what it, and my eyes aren't quite good enough on, on it doesn't use fat, but it's about that big. It might be stout. Uh, and then he's got brown hair, black hair, uh, or black, uh, brown, uh, brown eyes, black hair. Uh, and then it'll say, do you have anything you know, that, that would prevent you from serving? So that's, he registers on June 5th, 1917. And everybody between, every male between the ages of 21 and 31 in the whole state had to register that day. And so you'll see thousands of these cards through that family search link to National Archives. So, you know, being a little history weirdo, or now a big history weirdo, uh, I decided to look up a few others. So here's Billy Jones, who I referenced a little earlier, and, and I wish I had had more time. You guys know how this goes. You never have enough time to dig into those stories that you wish you could tell. So I'm learning more about Billy Jones and some of the Meskwaki soldiers, but they all claim uh, to be exempt from service because they say, we're non-citizens, we don't have the same rights. But they still get put into service. So Billy Jones down there says, I'm a non-citizen, non and he's, he's short, and he's got a medium build, brown uh, eyes, black hair, and he does, he, he serves. So he enlists, or he signs up June 5th, uh, 1917, and then they, so it's, it's Selective Service Act, because they don't do a draft, this is so you can get drafted. So that's the next step after this, is once you're registered, you get assigned your number, and then your local draft board, so a draft board in Tama would have put the numbers in and pulled out the names, and, and Billy's number was one that came up. Uh, and then the other one that I wanted, or that I'm gonna show you, is a man from Clark County. His name is Forrest Eugene Landis. And he's from Weldon, and he was uh, born in 1885, so he's in that old bracket. He's, you know, uh, over 35 years old. So he signs up on September 12, 1918. That's my grandfather. Uh, my middle name's Eugene after him. Uh, so he never serves, because the war's over in about two months after this. But they didn't know that at the time. So even if, you know, you think, people in your community who are older aren't being forced to sign up, they sure are. So <clears throat> just south of us is where Clark County and Weldon are, most of you know geography, but thank you for indulging me on letting me put in my grandfather. So I'm the youngest of a Catholic family, so that's why I've got a grandfather born in 1885. <clears throat> And here's the sort of material both in our collection and some of that newspaper research again, going back to that. And it's one where you all know like your students' saturation limits, but if you've got students or I would encourage you also to participate in the Iowa National History Day program. Uh, this is great material. So in our collection here in Des Moines, we've got over 2,000 photographs of men and a few of the women who gave their lives in service. Uh, on the left there is Fred Becker from Black Hawk County. He was the University of Iowa's first uh, All-American. He was a lineman. And uh, he was killed in France uh, <clears throat> late in the war. So that's Fred Becker. I didn't look for his death notice, but I'm sure I could find one fairly easily in one of the Waterloo papers without much difficulty. And, and that's kind of fun to find people with, and he's awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the DSC is what that stands for down there. Uh, killed in action. And so <clears throat> those are the sorts of photographs we have, and we also have photos obviously of people like Billy Jones. Billy Jones and Jonas Pawashik survived, but we've got photographs of them. Uh, another piece that I did in doing one of my Red Cross nurse searches was finding uh, that as a memorial to women who died in service, they planted 11 birch trees on the state capitol grounds. Uh, they're long gone now, but for, again, I, uh, Marion Crandall from Davenport, she was born in Cedar Rapids. Her family moves to the Omaha area, then uh, they come back to Iowa for a while, but she's working in a canteen in France in 1918, and she's the first United States woman uh, in service to die 
while the war while we're in the war. So Marion Crandall's a good compelling story for you if you're in eastern Iowan or <coughs> Lynn County's East Central to me, but Davenport, she was teaching at an Episcopal school shortly before the war uh, in Davenport called St. Catherine's School. So that's one. <coughs> We've got Elsie Hatch of Edgewood, so that's northeast Iowa. And, and that's what drives me nuts about some of these accounts is they don't always tell you where they're from. <clears throat> so Edgewood is like Clayton, Delaware County line. But Kathleen Kennebec of Carroll, I think she's an Irish Catholic girl if I remember right. Uh, she dies in service. Uh, Rose Buman from, uh, she, and she doesn't even get listed because she dies of the flu, but she's a nurse that I discovered because she's in our photos of the uh, Iowans who gave their lives in service. She, uh, she dies She's from Shelby County, uh, and uh, then uh, I think Dorothy Kellner of Fort Madison, I believe we have her photo as well. Uh, so those are some of the women who are recognized as having given their lives in service, but there's people, as we said, like Grace Van Evra who come back and work, she comes back and works as a nurse in Scott County. And so who knows who Merle Hay is? Tell me about Merle Hay. after the United States enters World War I. That's the qualifier, and I just learned this because I came across a photo in that group of photos of a man named John Maxwell who is Scottish. And uh, so Merle Hay from Glidden, so Carroll County. Uh, <clears throat> this isn't supposed to all be about Carroll County, by the way. Uh, he's serving in France in uh, Late 1917, he's one of the first three uh, servicemen serving on behalf of the United States killed in World War I. So that's why Merle Hay Road in Des Moines is Merle Hay Road. It takes you up to Camp Dodge where Merle Hay trained. That's why Merle Hay Mall is Merle Hay Mall because it's on Merle Hay Road named after Merle Hay. So I grew up in central Iowa knowing that Merle Hay was one of the first three Americans killed in World War I. Well, that's mostly true, but John Maxwell who was from Mystic, which is down around Centerville. So this is the Centerville paper, uh, July 7th, 1917. Look at that, that's about four months before Merle Hay dies. And it says, John Maxwell killed in action in France. Uh, her real name was uh, Boslin, it's a typo on her name. Her name was Grace, she's buried in the Mystic Cemetery. It says, Mr. and Mrs. Alexander Boslin received a letter from Scotland mentioning mentioned the death of their brother, John Maxwell, killed in action somewhere in France. Uh, Scotty Maxwell, as he was lovingly called, spent 10 years in Mystic. He didn't really spend 10 years in Mystic. Don't always believe what you read in the paper. Uh, he was still in Pennsylvania in 1910, because I tracked him down. Uh, but he was well known. Uh, oh, I, should, I skipped something. He was uh, Mystic 10 years and boarded with the above named family. So that's his sister and brother-in-law. He was well known, loved, and respected by all who knew him. He left Mystic January 1915 and joined his old regiment, the 42nd Black Watch Highlanders at Glasgow, Scotland, and was sent to France where he saw some hard fighting. He was killed last February, actually it was April, uh, <laughs> and sleeps in a soldier's grave somewhere in France and is deeply mourned by his sister, brother-in-law, and family, and a host of friends. So there were men leaving Iowa before, and he's not the only one. I know of at least a couple of Canadians who were living in Iowa. So they're Iowans, but they're not always US citizens, and they joined the war effort because the British and, uh, were recruiting men from the United States to join the war effort if they had dual citizenship or hadn't become US citizens yet. So John Maxwell, we've got him in his kilt uh, in his photo. That, presumably came to us from his sister, but that shows up in the Centerville uh, newspaper on July 7th, 1917. So she doesn't even learn about his death until about three months after it happens, or two, two months, because it is uh, April when, when he dies. So, so that is about three, because that's uh, fourth month. So those, again, are some of those things that, looking through our resources here at the State Museum, doing searches, uh, you can find, and so if you use 
that somewhere in France term in your community paper you might come across a soldier. I know one in Cass County uh, who dies and I think in August of 17. So I know of at least two soldiers who die. And that's not to marginalize Merle Hay at all uh, or anyone else's sacrifice. But uh, always realize that things we sometimes learn in school, there may be a little more twist, a little complexity on that. <clears throat> so just some things to know about uh, anti-Germanism in Iowa. So we are the one state where our governor, Governor William Harding, issues an executive proclamation on May 23rd, 1918. It gets called the Babel Proclamation after the war. I've, I've seen it once at the time it happens, called the Babel Proclamation. It's out of the Sioux City uh, German language newspaper. Uh, they call it the Babel Proclamation. Maybe one of the Des Moines papers does. I haven't searched all of them. But it bans the speaking of all languages but English in public uh, places. So if you were a <coughs> Danish church in uh, Shelby County or uh, you know, up in Kingsley or Pearson where there's a, a Kingsley area where there's, Pearson is, is strong uh, or Swedes or Czechs in eastern Iowa and you were used to saying your service in some language other than uh, English that was banned by executive proclamation. It never got challenged because it happens May 23rd, 1918. Uh, and so the war only lasts another six months. But for six months, and it was a, a major issue, uh, our governor and our defense league are enforcing uh, English only uh, provisions. And <coughs> A good resource, and I'll pull up an example, and, and we'll see how it looks on the screen. Uh, can, you can find some of these through the German Iowa and the Global Midwest site that is on your resource sheet handout. Uh, and then, as I said, if you use that yellow paint search, uh, you'll get some of those attacks on German businesses and, and Iowans. Yeah. That's an excellent question because, yeah, so I don't think it applied to Latin mass because it wasn't an active conversational language. So I think the Catholics dodged it because it's not where, you know, it's all re repetition. It's all, you know, it's the same thing over and over. So there's no conversation happening in Latin. So I think Catholics get a waiver on that. I haven't fully documented it, but I had somebody ask me that the other day and thought about it and it's like okay there aren't real Latin conversations happening so Catholics dodge it. Yeah it wasn't some early pre-Vatican II effort to put the Catholic Mass into uh, the English language. So here's a copy and we have this and it'll be part of the uh, text set that we're doing uh, for high school, this is the Babel Proclam what gets called the Babel Proclamation. I'll call it the English only proclamation because, as I said, I've only seen it called the Babel Proclamation in one pre-1919 newspaper. Uh, and we will have that available. I may drop it into my folder since I've got it. But it's just a, you know, a simple two-page document saying, you know, I hereby declare that uh, no language but English shall be spoken in the state of Iowa. And just, I think most of you may know this, but English was pa passed as our official state language in 2001 or 2002. Uh, so <coughs> uh, we have had representatives in our st state house uh, complain when things have been printed in languages other than English after 2001, 2002, and I think those have stood up. I mean, like when uh, Secretary of State might print something in uh, Spanish and it's like oh state resources aren't supposed to be spent that way. Yeah this is a National Defense League and this is part of the uh, German Iowa and the Global Midwest page and if you go to that search link that's on the handout and you type in Hun or books this is a letter that's uh, asking and it's a library actually reporting back. This is the Missouri Valley Public Library, so over in western Iowa, just north of Council Bluffs, uh, Missouri Valley. 
saying, I've looked through our shelves, found a couple of books that defended the sinking, I found one book or a pamphlet that defended the sinking of the Lusitania, so I burned it. <laughs> and I found one other, uh, you know, uh, see, I, I, I uh, burned both books and pamphlets. So saying I found four pamphlets and a pro-German book, some pro-German books. And so, you know, we think of book burning as, as like a hysterical Nazi thing uh, when you think of World War II. Well, Iowa librarians were proudly burning books and pamphlets during 1918. Uh, and that's part of that, what is, you know, appropriate behavior in patriotism or in a war effort? That's, that's part of that compelling question, you know, is it painting somebody's fence yellow? Is it burning books at your library and pamphlets? And our state archives collection has multiple, dozens of these sorts of letters. Uh, and this is one that's available on the internet, so if you take your students to that uh, German Iowa and the Global Midwest site that University of Iowa, Glenn Erstein, who's a, uh, in the Department of German Language at U of I, uh, has put, put these together. They're not always the best quality digital uh, images. It's like some of them were shot with phones, I think, by, student, by undergrads. This is one where it looks pretty good. Uh, there was like a section of the table that it was shot on down on the lower corner when I cropped it out. So if you're looking at how Iowans served, some good service topics to look at, of course, are women at work, African Americans, Meskwaki participation. When I've done Meskwaki as a search term in newspapers, I've come up with a few articles on the Meskwaki men serving. So Jonas Pawashik's name shows up. I think Billy Jones's name shows up. Uh, <clears throat> Another good search term is just, or topic is, is youth and what children and young people were doing, so your students. Uh, Liberty loans, besides the larger $25 loans, they did these uh, little tear-off coupons that you could buy for a dime. And so students were also participating in Liberty loans. And there were also across the state things called slacker raids, and it was especially in 1918 Davenport has a big one, but they happen across the state in larger towns usually. But <clears throat> the, one of the Davenport papers reports on the slacker raid in Davenport that they round up essentially, or, and it's a bit of vigilantism. I mean, it's deputized uh, citizens who say, because you were supposed to keep your draft registration card with you, uh, your copy, to prove that you had registered for the draft. And so it's like, let me see your card, and if they didn't have their card, they took you to the Davenport jail. So uh, if you just, slacker is another good newspaper search term to look for uh, in period, period accounts. And here's an example of, I'm pretty sure this is a junior Red Cross group here in Des Moines, uh, but they're all African American young women <coughs> and I say I'm pretty sure they're the Junior Red Cross. The, the photo isn't labeled this way, but you see the red crosses in the background, uh, and all being young women. So I think they're practicing fitness to be, you know, good, healthy Iowans. Uh, and here's a piece from uh, <coughs> that Kingsley paper where the Glee Club, as I said, has a fundraiser. Uh, so this is Northwest Iowa. That Kaiser advertisement. I was trying to see if I can't quite make out on, on this screen. Uh, there's also a couple other events on this page, too, where they, uh, oh, here you go. And this is one I liked on this page, too. German language banished from public schools. And uh, as I said, this is a uh, earlier, I'm going to double check the, the date on this one, see if it's pre or post. Babel Proclamation. Uh, 
that's pre-Babel proclamation. It's April 25th. That's what I thought. So you've got you know schools banning the German language even before the Babel before the English lang English only proclamation is issued. So ingrained into uh, talking about the Babel proclamation that uh, I fall into that. And that's a photo from our Des Moines collection of the African American young women. Uh, and then just some other resources. We'll see if I can jump to that really quick. Uh, the Rainbow Division is an Iowa strong unit that the Winifred Robb, who was a chaplain for one of the companies in the Rainbow Division, coordinates printing a book called The Price of Our Heritage. And it comes out uh, 1918, I believe. And as I said, this will be available. It's in, in my shared folder for Stephanie, so I think she'll make this available to you all. So uh, archive.org, which is a free portal for various, this is going to take a minute to load because it's a decent sized file, but uh, maybe not too long. Yeah, so the price of our heritage, uh, discussing the 168th, which was the Rainbow Division. They, the, World War I is the first time that you don't serve necessarily with just Iowans. In the Civil War, Spanish-American War, Iowa National Guard, Iowa units, stayed with Iowa units. World War I, U.S. Army says, you know what? We're going to be one big melting pot, except for African Americans. Uh, Latinos in Meskwaki, and there are a few Latinos in Iowa in, in 1918 who, who serve, uh, they will be integrated in, but African Americans are always, always separate. Uh, so Price of Our Heritage has photos of soldiers from across the state it's Iowa only, so that's one worth browsing if you want to try to track down somebody uh, from your community. That's, that's one worth looking at. And a lot of counties did both it was doubly a Gold Star tribute by Gold Star. World War I is the first time you start seeing the service banners with the blue star and then if a s soldier is killed, they put a Gold Star over it and that banner hangs in your home window. That's why the Iowa Gold Star Museum up at Camp Dodge is the Iowa Gold Star Museum. It's dedicated to all military service, but especially to those Iowans who gave their lives. So you'll see, uh, I know Jasper County has one. Uh, just about every county does a county war history, but I should say about 50%, so I shouldn't say every. Uh, and it's usually the larger counties, but I know some of the smaller counties would do a newspaper uh, tribute, usually around Decoration Day, what we think of as Memorial Day, 1919, uh, publishing photos of, of soldiers who were Gold Star soldiers. So sometimes look at that. Uh, late May 1919 newspaper from your community uh, for the Decoration Day memorial tributes. And then just as a, another resource, the Library of Congress has digitized their posters from World War I. Uh, I, love, I love and both hate this Remember Belgium one because you've got this German soldier leading a girl to who knows where. I mean, the phrase was the rape of Belgium. So that's something that people in the period knew what that meant. And again, depending on what age of students you're working with, maybe inappropriate, maybe not an appropriate topic, or may never be. That's where you know your classroom and your school principal and your school district better than I do. But the man who does this poster, Ellsworth Young, is from Albia. His father, Josiah Young, uh, was uh, a Secretary of State for the state of Iowa served in the uh, Civil War. And so Ellsworth then goes and takes fine art training 
Uh, so it's an anti-German poster uh, <clears throat> from, uh, this is a 1918 poster because it's the fourth Liberty Loan. Uh, this is one we have in our collection as well. I hate it when I use a this is. Another poster we have in our collection is, you know, for every woman, or for every fighter, a woman worker. This was one of the hardest things for me as a historian to track down, and I'm, I'm like you, I'm on limited time uh, when I'm working on an exhibit, but I wanted to try to track down some accounts of women workers. So one that I know is the foundry at Waterloo Gasoline Engine there were women working in the foundry in 1918 because men had gone to war. So uh, that's one I definitively know uh, where women got put into a job they normally wouldn't have access to in World War I, so a pre-Rosie the Riveter story. I don't know their names. I haven't had a chance to try to track them down or see what either uh, the Grout Museum and Sullivan Brothers Museum up in Waterloo might have something on them, uh, but women, uh, certainly we're, we're doing uh, jobs that not in the same way in World War II. Again, that's the thing to keep in mind because the war period is, is shorter. And then <clears throat> one of my favorite posters just of the period is the Americans All poster that comes out uh, early because this is the Victory Liberty Loan, so it's, it's a 1917, early 1918 poster. And You've got all these names listed on it. We have multiple examples of this poster in our collection. So you know it was mass produced. All of these were mass produced. Maybe not the YMCA one quite so much uh, because I only know of a couple examples of, of that YMCA poster, one in our collection and a couple of others. Uh, but remember Belgium and American All? Those were printed by the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. Uh, and we have four or five of the Remember Belgiums. We have four or five of Americans All just that came out of the Des Moines area and into our collection after the war. And these are all digitized on the Library of Congress posters uh, pages. So if you Google, you know, LOC, American Memory, war posters, you'll get this link. Uh, this, this one is not a Library of Congress. They don't have this one, so you won't see that one. Uh, but they have other women worker posters. Uh, but on this Americans All, the first name is either Dubois or Dubois. Well, that could be French or African American because W.E.B. Dubois is the prominent African American founder of the NAACP, or one of the founders and leading voices of the NAACP. They got a you know, boring name like Smith. No offense to any Smiths in the room. It's not boring, sorry. Uh, O'Brien, so Irish. Sheka, which is Czech, that's how I say that, C-E-J-K-A. I know a Sheka up around the Cedar Rapids area. Uh, you've got Papandrakopoulos, I mean a good Greek name in there. Uh, Andrasi, Valetto, uh, Levy, so Jewish with Levy, Turovich. Uh, and it just keeps going on. You got a, a looks like a Kowalski there, yeah. Uh, another Vich name, and so, and even a Gonzales or a Gonzales listed on there. So even in 1918, 1917, promoting we're all Americans, and uh, we all need to be helping out in the war effort. Uh, so that Americans all is a, a good one to, like, maybe do some research in your community. Not that you're going to find a lot of Gonzaleses, but you might through. Uh, the registration cards and just see what heritage some of these people say they are. Cross-reference them to uh, a census record, which you can get through Family Search as well, and see what their uh, cultural background, their country background is. Just another resource that's great for all of you to uh, Keep in your uh, bag of tricks is we have the Iowa Cultural app that the Department of Cultural Affairs created. And this spring we launched a World War I featured tour. So if you download Iowa Culture app to your phone, there's actually a web component too. It's dsayapp.com, uh, I believe. I'll, I'll do a quick search. But if you go over to the featured side and then scroll down, you'll see the World War I tour. And so these are all sites across the state connected to 
uh, World War I. So uh, I'm pretty sure one of these two here, looking at map lines, is that Centerville? My Annapolis County right there. I, I think it is because Centerville has a great memorial arch at Oakland Cemetery and it's got a gold star plaque on it. So it lists uh, John Maxwell on it uh, because he's Appanoose County. It also lists Wayne Miner who he's an African American man. His family were coal miners in uh, Appanoose County and he gets sent out on a mission on November 11th, 1918 in the morning and he doesn't come back. And so Wayne Miner is a tragic, compelling story uh, out of Centerville. So that's what we talk about on the, the Iowa Culture app is some of these different sites across the state that are connected to World War I. So you've got, you know, Gold Star <laughs> Museum. Also, Polk County has a Gold Star Memorial just north of us on University. If you took uh, East of uh, Pennsylvania, you've got to go north on Pennsylvania and you go Right before you go to the river, there's a large uh, granite and uh, bronze sculpture, and it's the Iowa, it's the Polk County Gold Star Memorial. So a lot of your communities will have, or your county seats are going to have, or cemeteries are going to have a, a Gold Star Memorial from World War One. Yeah. That's what we saw is that the Memorial Arch at, at the Oakland Cemetery in Centerville had, had recently been restored. So good, good for you guys for keeping a, uh, taking care of it. So that's, that's something I wanted to point out. Also, I put it on the sheet, and I haven't had a chance to uh, look at it, is that uh, there's another app that's just been launched, and that's the, uh, <coughs> On the back page, I didn't number the pages, but uh, a Remembering World War I app that National Archives has collaborated with people on. So it's trying to do a national effort, and if you wanted to have your students uh, work on a project, it's a crowdsourced site page uh, with a group called History Pin. And I haven't looked at it. I've played with History Pin a little bit in my past, but History Pin tries to crowdsource uh, local history sites and photographs and other things. So that's one you might want to look at just, just from a national perspective. Uh, while you're looking at that, if you're looking at teaching resources on the back page, uh, National Archives has some good document analysis worksheets. So if you want to do a unit using those Library of Congress posters, National Archives has some good uh, document resources on how to look at a document. I, I think it, I look, I've looked at them. They're good for high school, maybe a little complex, but as a group activity might work for middle school, uh, or should work for middle school. I wouldn't say might. Again, look at what uh, National Archives has put together there for that. And uh, I actually wanted to bring up one other piece. Uh, I listed on the handout and referenced <coughs> on the handout uh, I'm just curious to get a sense of this and it's not, who knows about chronicling America, raise your hand. Got a couple, very good. So that's fine that you don't know about chronicling America. It's a Library of Congress initiative and the State Historical Society has been uh, very active in getting grants to digitize in really good format. That's one of the problems uh, that I find with some of the advantage digitization is the quality. 90% of the time is really good. 10% of the time you'll, you'll get into a marginally digitized site. But uh, <clears throat> I want to bring this up and then just see if we have any last questions or comments in our last 10 minutes. So Chronicling America and I'll just do, you know, I'm, I'm using Firefox, Google Chrome will work. Uh, my regrets if you're, not, I shouldn't beat up on whatever uh, Microsoft is using these days. Microsoft makes great products. Uh, LOC, let's 
So I just did LOC, Chronicling America, Iowa. We'll see what I get as my, there we go. And we tried to, you know, do the whole state <laughs> or geographically represent, not do the whole state, but, you know, you've got Audubon, so west central, western Iowa, Cresco, north central, Denison, so west. Uh, Der Democrat is, unless your students read German, that's not going to be real helpful. Uh, another uh, one of that, but Marshalltown, so east, nah, central. Iowa State Bystander is the African American newspaper printed in Des Moines. And they have lots of material on reports of soldiers, and <clears throat> they're from across the state, mostly southern Iowa, Des Moines, some Davenport. Uh, and when I say southern Iowa, it kind of ends like right around Lamoni, where coal mining stops. Uh, so uh, you may get some. I found in the August 6th, not August, April 6th, the bystander, you know, they knew the war was coming probably when he went to press, but he does a little piece on uh, African Americans being called to serve and, and just saying, you know, why should we fight, I think was the topic of his, you know, little two paragraph, maybe three paragraph piece on why African Americans should fight. And <clears throat> says, you know, we don't, uh, we, aren't, we aren't trusted with the same level of, of rights, but just like when Lincoln needed soldiers during the Civil War, when we get called, we're, we are going to serve. Uh, and we'll do it honorably and gladly, and hopefully someday we'll have the same rights as everybody else. Uh, so that's, you know, you can browse the bystander, uh, but again, just, you know, man, Leon, don't want to skip Leon, so. Uh, you know, South Central Iowa, Manchester, so Delaware County, uh, going up to North uh, Eastern Iowa, I guess. Missouri Valley, Ottumwa, Ottumwa. We'll scroll down and see where the plane dealer is from. So this is one where they're going to be really high quality images, and they are going to be. Uh, <clears throat> most of them are going to have a run into. World War I, not always. So, you know, like the, this Cresco paper, and that's one of the things that kind of drives me nuts about the Chronicling America site, is it doesn't always group like the Cresco papers together. It's like, could you not figure out a way to do that? Uh, Webster City, uh, the bystander shows up again because they changed their name. Uh, so, from 1906, 1922, it's called the bystander. So, that's the one you want to look at if you're browsing. Daily Gate City from Keokuk. So those are the papers uh, that have been digitized as part of the Chronicling America site. And as I said, the bystander, if you want to bring some cultural diversity uh, and different perspectives into your classroom besides just the standard, that's, that's a good one and it will. They'll occasionally reference men from Waterloo. Uh, trying to think if I've seen anybody from Sioux City referenced in it. Uh, or Council Bluffs for the western part of the state. But uh, those that I know Ottumwa has men that serve and, and usually get referenced uh, who are African Americans. So Oskaloosa because of Buxton, which was a coal mining community that was mixed race. See a lot of Oskaloosa, Oskaloosa area, Mahaska County folks uh, getting mentioned. And it's just a good, if you need a resource in your classroom that talks about uh, African Americans in Iowa, uh, Pre-1923, because that's everything that's uh, out of copyright, and that's when Library of Congress has them stop, whereas what you might get through the UNI site will be post-1923 if you're doing another topic, just for the record. So uh, that was the last resource I wanted to share. Thank you for your time this morning. We've still got a couple minutes, I think. So any questions, comments for me? Uh, as I said, don't, don't get bogged down. We've got seven minutes. Don't get bogged down in the... Militarism, uh, alliances, imperialism and nationalism, that's, that's a big deal. But think of that local perspective or at least statewide perspective and you can give your students a really rich experience on learning how Iowans were similar and, and different and, and how World War I uh, shaped our state. And that's the last piece I'll give you 
is the 1920s, and, and I don't think Iowa is out of the norm, uh, but towns like Rolf, which is up in Pocahontas County, but I also know uh, Ossian, which is up by uh, Dubuque, in like 1923, 1924, and this is happening before the war, but it's when everybody comes home and then starts worrying about what's happening to our state. I mean, we, we put in prohibition, Iowa passes the local, it takes away local option in 1916, so we actually go back to prohibition before the national prohibition piece. So remember that. That's part of the whole prohibition story in Iowa. Uh, <coughs> the strong Methodist uh, uh, influence on our state really shapes that, and I think that's a good thing. It's, it's good to debate those questions. Uh, at, but about 1923, communities across the state start passing local ordinances on jazz dancing and jazz music and that you have to have a matron in place and, and the Rolf Arrow prints their whole municipal statute in the paper saying you know there has to be all these things the dance has to be done by midnight uh, so it's almost like foot loose <laughs> with Kevin Bacon only this is 1920s Iowa and I, as I said I know Ossian passes a bill on jazz dancing and what is required but the Rolf one is the, the one that I've seen that's most explicit that shows up in the newspaper. So automobiles, I mean, if you've got high school students and you want a topic, the idea and the term is petting, having petting parties uh, where kids are going out in their cars and who knows what they're doing in those cars. So that's the aftermath of World War I is, you know, you've got jazz music, you've got automobiles, you've got all, you've got, you know, now movies that are even more and more popular and so our country is going to you know hell in a handbasket so uh, <laughs> there you go any any questions comments all right we're done four minutes early thank you so much for your time have a great day today